Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good day to each one, um, to everyone of you. Well, neutrality course, neutrality in the 21st century, and why it remains relevant. So we are currently on our fifth session for today, and we're very glad to have you up to this point of our webinar. So before we start with our fifth session, as always, let's just have um, a quick recap. And this fifth session will focus on the role of civil society in neutrality, how to strengthen movements and resist to the threats of the neutrality. Okay, so quick uh, recap of the day. Let's scan this QR code or kindly type in your browser menti.com or the code is 35716158. Yeah, hopefully everyone is there. And let me just stop sharing this screen and let me just pull out my next screen. If you haven't um, scanned the QR code, let me just paste on the chat box the link and the code. Mm -hmm. Let me just pull up my recap. Okay. I think every one of you is in the room already. Let me just share my screen. Okay. All right. Oh, okay. Okay, we have the first question of the day, just to have a slide um to check in with you to every one of our participants here today. Just like to know how, how are you so far about your knowledge on neutrality? You are currently on the fifth session. So is your knowledge of neutrality still a little bit or slightly learn something new or have you gained a better understanding so far and gain different knowledge about it or if you want to want that broader knowledge or already know everything about neurality at this point <laughs> so just like to check in like how do you feel um so far about the neutrality of course if you cannot access the mentimeter you can use our chat box type in here if you're still in number one two three four or five Okay, in the chat, we receive also three, mostly our number three. Glad to know that at least we gained some knowledge so far about neutrality. Three and four, between, between the four, three and four, it's a good. Okay. 3.5, <laughs> two, slightly learn. Yeah, thank you everyone for um sharing. How are you so far under your knowledge regarding the neutrality course? It will help us to um to further um refine our topic for our next session yeah for the next one um last week we study about geopolitics of what currently happening in the neutrality in the 21st century and would like to have some sort of short reflection for today uh, for you um what does it mean to be neutral in the 21st century? What have you learned from the geopolitical, uh, geopolitics reality in the different countries such as the Ukraine, um, Australia, Philippines, Guahan or Guam, and also um, the realms of peace of neutrality that we have learned last week. I will have responses here and bias. Is seeking to be a peacemaker. Country's national interest, not part of not part of black. Okay. Balance. All right. To stay outside the war, to have more options regarding peacemaking. Okay, we have seen that. Daring cutting, daring cutting edge peacemaking. And we have seen that in the examples of um Australia and the PPS. 
Neutrality in, Eu in Europe has lost importance due to the Ukraine conflict and the loss of two neutral states at the same states. Uh, Neutral's use of means to protect sovereignty. The best solution out from conflicting party, better position to be a genuine mediator, peace broker, voice of diplomacy without a war driven. Uh, thank you everyone for sharing. Um, what does it mean to be neutral in the 21st century? Of course, we would like to hear your views as well. And of course, what have you um, learned so far? And also in session four, we have learned that um, during the Cold War era, bipolarity emerged as a dominant geopolitical structure. However, around um, 1991, the abolition of the war so packed. It marks also the rise of the new groups, such as the non-alignment movement, which is comprising the different independent. So this movement refused to align with the two hegemonic powers, which is con concurrently give rise also to unipolarity that emerged characterized by US supremacy, while Russia was being recuperating from conflict and NATO remained intact. So in this unipolar era, as we have learned during the geopolitics session is that um, it also gave rise to neoliberalism and private privatization, which gained prominence, um, which lead to U.S. multinational corporations to seek cheap labor in China, uh, which is more cost effective and disciplined in terms of labor force. Um, it became a de primary destination for so. Throughout the decades, we have seen the rise of globalization, rise of also of new economies such as India, South um, Brazil, South Africa, and some, and also throughout the 10 decades or more than two decades, we have seen the stabilization of Russia as well. So with the growing economic um, power of Russia, terrorism that was happened in 2000s, and also, um, and we have witnessed what happened in, during the 2009, which um, the U.S. Secure, security plans have um, expanded that encompass sea, water, and land territories, which greatly also affected um, and posed some threats to build some military bases in different countries. And despite the attempts by Russia and China with the U.S., it's still not it doesn't happen so consequently the u.s extends its influence to west asia asia pacific and the middle middle east russia gained its um gain the russia also expands its alliances towards central asia and also ex and even though it's also not not notable that even china and russia has strong um economic ties they don't have yet the military alliances so this period it leads to the evolving geopolitical dynamics that's a sound as somehow seen already in our international relations present opportunities for multipolar system neutrality common security initiatives expansion of power among us china and russia political um, dynamics or developments that happen as you have seen this in different countries that presented before and also you mentioned here in your reflection about the effects of neutrality it also put um, complexities to the geopolitical positions of Australia, Philippines, Guahan and Ukraine so despite also a um, strong constitutional emphasis on renouncing the war such as, such as in Russia as such as in Australia and the Philippines um how, it that however um there have been still in a complex position of being have a strong economic ties with China while also maintaining military alliances with the US so this lead to a very complex situations and as a Guahans, as also one mentioned here in our um answer, put in a position Han is not political. This instance cannot be a neutral because they are under US territory, but they have benefited to the 
they have benefited to the from the neutral stage, which served them as a mediator to facilitate free talks and diplomacy that happen um, when there's a conflict within the country as, as well. And also, it's important to note that throughout what happened with the neutrality, it's also important to note that the indigenous people contributions or indigenous own resiliency in opposing the war and military militarization. So also to cap up um, from the last week's discussion, um, the neutrality in Ukraine, as we have seen the shifting um, narratives that from the shift narratives of which drastically change um, from being neutral country to being involved in a war and as our last speaker Yuri mentioned last week that um, it suggests that to re-evaluate neut neutrality a more proactive pacifism to resolve conflicts and without resorting to violence and also our last speaker um, Professor Pascal also mentioned that neutrality is only one of many tools that we might use among others, to achieve the goal of global peace, because currently we don't have yet uh, um, more um, alternative solutions. But of course, also this course also help us to seek more, um, to reevaluate also um, what are the how can we better off with neutrality. So as long as, and the argument last week, as long as we don't have good alternatives, so at least a world government with world and the neutrality like alliances will remain a strategy to the same problem. So um just to show you um that neutrality is only one of the tools for peace, it's also neutrality in some countries have seen can result into a war. However, um, for in the realms of peace and the peace lens on how the neutrality contributes, this is like the summary from the last week, wherein we know that neutral neutral countries have um if the countries are neutral, fair, um all warfare that short also includes the self defense and also creates a good offices, a humanitarian activity, and I think with the three. Um, with the past three sessions, we have dealt into the different case studies already about this, um, um, the, real, the lens of peace through neutrality. Um, and thank you for sharing about your views as well, about how does neutrality viewed in the 21st century. And without further ado for session five, it's now, let's now more delve into how does neutrality in different countries look like in terms of the civil and how the civil society or the individuals or groups of organization um, does its work for neutrality. So today we will unfold the role of civil society in neutrality and I will give our flo my, the floor. Let me just share, stop sharing my screen. Session of today on the role of civil society and neutrality, Neil, as our chair and moderator of the session. Neil, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Michelle. Um, hi, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Neve Nivrian. Um, I'm with the Transnational Institute based in Amsterdam, um, but originally from Ireland. Um, and I will be moderating the first part of this session today. Um, and the idea with today's session is that it's very much about uh, participation. So we'll have a few brief uh, um, yeah, introductions, I suppose, at the beginning to give us some, some content for f food for thought on top of the last four weeks that we've already had. And then the idea is that we'll be put into breakout groups. So hopefully everyone has a working microphone and a camera if, if that's possible. Um, and the idea is that we'll really be able to actually exchange between each other in the in today's session as well as, as what we have been doing in the chat. Um, so as Michelle said, the focus of today's session is very much looking at the role of civil society. Um, in our preparation for this uh, for this session, we actually got into very interesting discussions ourselves in the preparation session about what neutrality might look like 
being built from the ground up, so not necessarily from the top down from the state level, but also if we were to imagine from civil society in countries that are not neutral um, and where you might be starting from zero, how would you imagine building neutrality from, from the ground up? Um, and somebody put in the chat just now actually that uh, neutrality is the best way to enforce international humanitarian law. Um, and I remember some examples of that when I lived in, in Colombia and there was the idea of building humanitarian zones in, in war zones. And the idea was that they would be on a very local level, they would become neutral spaces where no armed actor could could intervene or could actually it come into the physical space. So I think today is very much about thinking outside the box of, of what neutrality might mean politically, legally, and really pushing our limits on what us as civil society actors might actually be able to do within our own sphere of influence to, to bring about more, more neutral spaces in, in today's world. Um, I... I'm, we're hoping to have three speakers, so we're hoping to have Bevan, who spoke last week on Australia, then we're hoping to have Gerhard from Austria, and then we're hoping to have Roger from Ireland. I'm not sure if Roger is on, on the call, so I think we'll start first with Bevan, then we'll move to Gerhard, then we'll see if, if Roger's here, and, and then we'll move on from there again. Um, I'll also be facilitating this discussion with Kath, who is on the call, and with Anne-Marie, who has prepared a number of questions. Um, so I think we'll, we'll, we'll start really, I think, by delving into a bit of what Bevan has already introduced on, on, on Australia. And some of what Bevan had mentioned was around the, the opinion polls and the political or the, the public support for neutrality in Australia. So maybe Bevan, you can expand a bit more on this in, in your discussion. Um, and when you finish, then I'll, I'll hand over to, to Gerhard. So Bevan, over to you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm with the uh, Independent and Peaceful Australia Network, which is a network in Australia of some 50 peace, community, faith and uh, trade union groups. And I'm speaking from the unceded lands of the Gadigal Indigenous people of Australia, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, Neutrality in Australia will be built from the ground upwards. There is no uh, interest in neutrality at the top political level, and um, it's all coming from grassroots and will be built, built from grassroots. IPAN, um, which is the organisation I'm speaking for tonight, uh, is operating in Australia in a political environment in which there is a huge disconnect between the position of the leadership of the nation and the wishes of the people of Australia. The Australian people want peace and for Australia to keep out of war. The leadership, and that includes both major political parties, the Liberal Coalition and the Labor Party, have enthusiastically embraced United States foreign policy especially in relation to China. They have committed Australia to the AUKUS War Pact with the United States and the United Kingdom with consequence, consequential integration of our defence forces with those of the US military. Their signing of the Force Posture Agreement has given the United States a military posture for their forces in Australia including unimpeded access to our ports and airfields with the stationing of their nuclear submarines in our ports and stationing of their B-52 bombers in our northern airfields. IPAN sees these agreements as a sellout of Australia's sovereignty. And furthermore, it has been done behind the backs of the people and parliament. Both have had no say or opportunity to discuss, let alone oppose, these agreements and war pact with the USA and the UK. The proposed acquisition of nuclear propelled submarines at the huge cost of $368 billion 
has been subject to no democratic discussion or decision making, and this public expenditure means a huge loss to addressing affordable housing, climate change and other pressing social needs. Now, what does the Australian people want? I said this last time and I'll repeat it. Two public opinion polls have shown the major or the majority of Australian people want Australia to keep out of a war against China and for the nation to embrace neutrality in this eventuation. The essential research opinion poll late last year showed two thirds of Australians favour neutrality if faced with such a war. Um, the Lowy Institute poll showed 73% of Australian women, three quarters of Australian women favour uh, keeping out of the war and, and, and embracing neutrality and two thirds of young people. Now, IPAN had already identified this deep concern for peace and an independent foreign policy through a national inquiry it held into the costs and consequences of Australia's involvement in US wars. That inquiry attracted 283 contributions from all parts of Australia and all walks of life. And its conclusions summed up in IPAN's inquiry, inquiry report showed concern that the close alliance with the United States is drawing us into wars which are morally reprehensible and have no relation to defence of Australia and everything to do with supporting aggressive US foreign policy. The inquiry report concluded that we need to keep out of such wars, distancing ourselves from United States foreign policy and charting our own course for peace and mutually beneficial relations with all countries. One outcome of the inquiry resulted in a lot of people in IPAN engaging with their local members of parliament and taking it into that arena and discussing the conclusions of the report with them. And as another outcome, we began to research into an alternative defence policy for an independent Australia. And IPAN promoted these through articles in independent journals and a number of national Zoom meetings with a variety of speakers, including some former members of the Australian Defence Forces. In 2023, these ideas on alternative defence were formulated into an IPAN vision for a system of, of, of alternative defence. And the concept of armed neutrality is central to this vision. So this is all at grassroots level. But in 1984, a, a, a journalist, David Martin, wrote a very comprehensive work entitled Armed Neutrality for Australia some three decades ago. He collaborated in the writing of this book with a range of defence, academic, diplomatic and military experts, both from Australia and overseas. Uh, in it, he says, and I quote, this book aims to show that the best policy for Australia is armed neutrality. It accords with our needs and our geographical position. Shaped to our means, it would be viable both morally and in practice, and it would let us stable, stable, establish stable and mutually beneficial relations with other countries, especially our neighbours, end of quote. He goes on to quote the former Austrian Chancellor, Dr. Bruno Kreisky, on principles to be observed by countries which consistently seek to practice neutrality. These are pretty interesting, and I quote, such a country cannot join military alliances in peacetime. That would destroy its ability to be neutral in time of war. It must allow no foreign military bases on its soil. They would diminish its freedom of action, or rather non-action, in wartime. And it must accept no obligations, political, economic or other, which would impair its neutrality in wartime. End of quote. 
More recently in Australia, Dr. Albert Palazzo, who was former director of war studies in the Australian Army headquarters. And he wrote a paper published in 2018, quite recently, and I quote, he said, the era of Australian dependency on a great power as a security policy is coming to an end. And that of armed neutrality is beckoning, end of quote. I like the quote from IPAN's alternative defence policy as follows. IPAN campaigns for an independent Australia that promotes peaceful and mutually beneficial relations with all countries. A truly independent Australia would seek to resolve hostilities and differences between countries in our region by peaceful diplomatic means. It would embrace a policy based on the principle of non-nuclear armed neutrality. Importantly, it would place primary reliance on the critical tools of diplomacy to foresee and resolve international differences and to develop positive and peaceful relations with all countries based on equality and mutual respect. Non-alignment could be a step towards neutrality. Neutrality, says IPAN, means that Australia would have no involvement in any wars between other countries. It would prevent Australian territory being used in such wars. And this necessarily means ending foreign military bases on our soil. End of quote. Finally, I'd like to say independence and neutrality as a national policy requires implementation of all the necessary measures to defend the country's independent neutral policy. This means appropriate defence of national territory, and in the case of Ireland, Australia, its approach waters. In Australia's case, this also means redeveloping manufacturing industry and putting strategic industries under public ownership and control. This is necessary to support a self-reliant, self-defence force and to ensure the nation can withstand economic pressure and possible shipping blockades from a hostile power. So IPAN, summing up, is seeking to engage with the broader Australian community, including at least one political party, in the discussion of its vision for an alternative defence based on armed neutrality. IPAN sees the adoption of such a policy as a natural consequence of an independent foreign policy enabling Australia to chart its own course for peace in the region and mutually beneficial relations with all countries. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bevan, for that. Um, and also thank you for 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 staying up until after midnight Australian time to to be able to deliver your your participation. So we really appreciate it. There was a comment in the chat. There were a few questions in the chat, but one was from Liz asking if you could share the report, the the inquiry report that you mentioned. Um, so maybe you can paste that in the chat and then hopefully in the, the other questions you can come back to when we have our discussion. Um, um, and, and yeah, maybe just picking up on a few things you mentioned, I was making notes as you were speaking, but I suppose the question of the gap, the, the, the significant gap between our political leadership and what they're agitating for and, and, and what people on the streets are calling for. And I think now at a time when we see the horrific and ongoing unfolding of, of genocide in, in Gaza, I think it's never been clearer that we have millions of people on the streets all over the world every single weekend for the last five months calling for an end to, to the genocide and for a ceasefire in Gaza. And simultaneously, we have in our parliaments all around the world, governments doing everything possible to, to continue with, you know, arming Israel, ensuring that it has everything that it needs politically, militarily, um, 
economically so that it can continue with its its genocidal war. So I think, yeah, you, you've touched on some questions that are very relevant to Australia, as you mentioned, but also I think that we, we can see them playing out in, in dynamics uh, in, in different places around the world. Um, I'll, I'll move on to Gerhard. Um, I see Gerhard is here. So Gerhard, you're going to speak a bit on um, yeah, I suppose the question of neutrality and Austria and the role of civil society in different to Australia. Austria is, in fact, a neutral country. So maybe you can also kind of, uh, yeah, compare that, I suppose, a bit to, to how things are in, in Austria, also keeping in mind what we heard just now from, from Bevan. So over to you, Gerhard. Yeah. Hello to everybody. Um, I have prepared some slides. Uh, Michelle uh, said she will put it on screen. I will first look a little bit back uh, in, in the history. Um, so I called uh, this uh, neutrality from below. It's not very fair because we have a long part in our history after the Second World War where the neutrality was more coming from top town, from above. <laughs> Yeah, but nevertheless, um, I called it, uh, this is what we do, the ABFANG, the organization, the Alliance uh, for Peace, Active Neutrality and Non-Violence. This, uh, the next slide. Uh, first, uh, after the uh, Second World War, we were occupied by the four uh, powers, uh, the Soviet Union, uh, the US, uh, Great Britain, and France. And here you have some historical photos where these four uh, op occupation forces uh, together smoking cigarette and also building uh, the police in Vienna. Yeah. Next slide, please. And uh, there was 10 years fighting uh, from the uh, from the government for independence and for uh, neutrality. And finally, in April 15th of 1955, uh, they, they succeeded to get signed the so-called Moscow Memorandum uh, from all four uh, winning powers. And after one month later, only one month later in Vienna, uh, in front of the Belvedere Palace, uh, our foreign minister, Leopold Fiegel, he presented the state treaty, which also included the neutrality. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. And then was a, quite an active time uh, where Austria proved its neutrality uh, with assistance to refugees from Hungary, 1956. There were a lot of hung Hungarian people coming over the border and then 1968 from Czech Czechoslovakia. And also the following years, Jews from Russia in the, in the 1970s. Yeah. And all this worked quite well. It was uh, well accepted by, by the um, broad public. And finally, in 1961, uh, Vienna hosted uh, this famous meeting between Khrushchev and Kennedy, where you always may know this, these pictures. And when uh, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned already Bruno Kreisky, he took power in the beginning of the 70s and was a social democrat and he um, brought in uh, the Palestinian forces, uh, mainly Arafat, uh, on stage. And you see the picture from 1979 where they were together uh, in a press uh, uh, conference, Arafat, Kreisky and Willy Brandt. Uh, it was a big step uh, with a big politician. Yeah. Next um, slide, please. But then in the 90s, 1995, we entered um, the European Union and in the same year also the NATO-based uh, uh, partnership for peace. And this is a point where most of uh, the 
peace organizations which are united in under Abfang, altogether 43 are fighting against that they say the NATO partnership for peace is not um, in cannot be unified with our neutrality, but we are a long time now in it. And then the next step was 2017 when uh, Austria signed this uh, PESCO contract, Permanent Structured Cooperation. Next slide, please. But so these were backlashes for uh, our efforts for um, strong neutrality, for engaged neutrality, but also from the diplomatic side, there were very good um, points to, to underline the neutrality, but this is not uh, very clearly, I, I say now, sold in Austria, it's more hidden. So it is not very well known under the public what we have done for this um, disarmament uh, treaties, where everywhere the Austrian diplomats were very much engaged, uh, first for the uh, convention of uh, anti-personal mines, then the prohibition of cluster munition, and finally uh, the TBNW, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, Alexander Gment is even uh, sometimes called, he is the architect of this uh, TBNW treaty. Yeah? But instead that the Austrian government points every week to these points, what we have done uh, for this armament to just keep it under the, the curtains. Yeah? Next slide, please. Uh, a very Um, a very important step in Austria, um, reached by tremendous uh, civil society effort, was the fight against uh, nuclear power. And we all uh, know that nuclear power and nuclear, nuclear weapons are twins. And uh, today, Austria has their very special uh, position. Um, in the moment, 29 countries of the world uh, uh, work with about 400 nuclear power plants. But Austria is the only country in the world that has built a commercial nuclear power plant, but never put it into operation. Today, it is a museum. And this was the consequence of the civil society efforts. Uh, you could not say it was the peace movement, it was more the, the green movement yeah, in Austria. This was in, in the 1970s and there was a referendum on 5th November 1978, uh, which was clear against uh, the atomic power plant. And one month later uh, in parliament, um, they said that it will not go in operation. And some years later, nine, 1999, there was an, an, a next public uh, referendum. And this uh, ended um, very clear uh, that Austria will never uh, get uh, nuclear power. And so called the non Nuclear Non Proliferation Act uh, has now constitutional status and is a law for a nuclear-free Austria. Next slide, please. <laughs> and this is the, uh, the way a lot of um, foreign countries see the Austrians, very alpine dressed. This is just uh, this weekend in the newspaper, there was a, a demonstration what makes the Austrian identity and how uh, see the population uh, and the foreigners, the Austrian society. And internationally, we are a land of, of music and, and of Alpine tradition. But here in, in Austria, the neutrality and especially uh, the non uh, a power, uh, that we have no nuclear power in our country, the people are proud of it and any ball, shows this clearly. So uh, the neutrality 
is um, is supported by 70 or 70 70 or more percent and uh, the last poll i saw the, when they ask if we have had to go to nato only one four percent 14 percent said yes this would be good for austria yeah but 70 percent said uh, neutrality is very important for austria and should stay like it is and for the uh, not to go uh, not to use nuclear power is even more uh, next slide please and now some words about our organization like i said it's an alliance uh, in the moment of 43 civil society organizations mainly peace organizations but also women organizations and non-violent anti-nuclear and, and uh, environmental organizations and some social organizations but we have not succeeded to win uh, some climate organizations also to join uh, this alliance because this would be very important you all know <laughs> uh, uh, how important it would be that also the, the climate organizations are fighting for peace yeah and all next slide please um all about our organizations and and the 43 members you find on the website uh, upfunk.org and we have hardly any resources that means all of us work voluntarily and uh, we get sometimes support or sponsoring for certain projects but in from the government there's no budget for peace there's only the budget for the military and um, we started last year uh, to opt uh, for a budget for peace as a neutral country we we could have a declared budget for peace and not only for military and this is one of the main focus point we we'll, we will point out uh, this and next year remember next year is 80 years of the end of world war ii and 70 years of the austrian uh, state treaty and the neutrality so it's an important year for us and this year is the austrian uh, national election in september and you know in in june the european election and we will also put an effort uh, to get budget for peace and climate protection this is a very important issue of uh, uh, our organization next slide yeah after the um, invasion of russia in in uh, february 9, uh, 2022 uh, just three weeks after we had a just for our <laughs> our dimension a peace demonstration a quite large peace demonstration in vienna where we could unite quite more than the 43 organizations but already at this moment, all bigger organizations like Amnesty International or Greenpeace, uh, they didn't want to join. Yeah? So just uh, in this, uh, it's very hard to get them in our line. Yeah. Next, please. Next slide. Yeah. And here I try to construct the so-called war of peace uh, where you find a lot of uh, positions which are very important for us and what we are fighting for i think everybody can underline this dedicated or engaged neutrality female peace power negotiations a peace logic non-violent resistance uh, diplomatic initiatives healthy environment nuclear free world and strengthen non-aligned and neutral countries yeah um, next please this is here written together i have also a, a script of that um, what i have told you and last uh, last slide please 
yeah, and we have this uh, folder where we sh show uh, what we are aiming for and where what is our position, our common position of the 43 organizations, because everybody has some special fields which are not in this common position. Last slide, please. Yeah, so we should come together and like Sisyphus try to reach the nuclear free and peaceful world. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Gerhard, for that. Um, I think that was very informative for many of us. Um, I think especially when you give this historical overview, when you see, for example, you have a meeting between Khrushchev and, and Kennedy in, in Vienna, when you can imagine something of that magnitude happening where you said big steps with big politicians. Um, and if you map that along a timeline where you eventually end up in a situation where you have Austria joining NATO's partnership for peace, um, you know, you, you can clearly see the direction that, that things are going in. So th thank you very much for, for this um, historical perspective. I wonder, is Roger on the call? Roger, are you here anywhere? I can't see everyone at the same time, but has anyone seen Roger or heard from Roger? And if not, I will attempt to fill in the gap since I'm from Ireland. Um, but yeah, big, shoe, big shoes to stand into, Rogers. Has anyone seen him? <laughs> no. No? No. Oh, okay. No. Okay, will, that's grand. I will, I will text him. Oh, I we already called him, Liz, right. and oh, we messaged God. him, but we, we couldn't get him. Okay, um, but thanks. no, no, thanks. Thanks for that, Liz. Um maybe I will try. I wrote down a few things. I'll mention just a few things, and then Liz, because you turned on your microphone, and I know <laughs> Liz and Eamon is also here. <laughs> um, and they're obviously very informed about neutrality as well. Maybe we can see how we do between us. So we're improvising and then we'll go on to the next stage of the of the program. But um, maybe just even just kind of thinking along what, what was mentioned on Austria, um, there's a lot of it that jumped out at me. And I also felt like it resonates a lot with what's going on in Ireland at the moment with um, the NATO Partnership for Peace stuff and the European Union and PESCO and, and, and all of that. Um, but maybe just to try and do a very quick historical overview along the lines of, of what Gerhard did. Um, I suppose for us in Ireland, neutrality was always very much about an anti-colonialist stance. And, and yeah, it's been very much the stance that we've had for over 100 years. So stemming very much from World War I and trying to separate ourselves out from British imperialism by having an anti-colonialist stance. Um, and that's very much kind of baked into the Irish identity. And I think Irish people in general and overall are very proud of, of the neutral stance that we have. Um, and proud of the kind of the role that Ireland could play in being a mediator or, a, 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 yes, a, I suppose, for promoting peace. Um, but very much similar to what, what Gerhard laid out for us in Austria, we've definitely had a shift whereby definitely from the top down from our government, we'll say, um, and definitely through initiatives that have been coming from from Brussels through the European Union, we've really had a, a yeah, and and our neutrality go in a direction which we even even using the word neutrality now has often got military neutrality tagged onto the end of it. What does that even mean in in international law when you have the Hague Five Convention specifically speaking about neutrality? Um, uh, th there's all sorts of initiatives taking place in Ireland which are to undo neutrality in all but its name. So we have an attempt to dismantle what in Ireland we call a triple lock. I know that Roger mentioned that a, a, a few weeks back when he did participate. Um, so I, I don't think I need to get into it again, but we very much have um, from our government an attempt, this kind of idea that Neutrality is an archaic uh, idea. It's outdated. It doesn't serve us anymore. Times have changed. The world has moved on. If we don't join the big boys and and get on the war bandwagon, we'll be left behind, and then we'll be attacked by by Russia. Is usually the the threat that's kind of rolled out at home. Russia cyber attack. 
is often mentioned as a potential or attacking the cables that because a lot of the international cables that that travel across the Atlantic come on shore in Ireland. This is often mentioned. So we have constantly um, the media rolling out this message that we're in danger. We need to defend ourselves. We need to step up to the mark. We can no longer rely on 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 allies. We have to defend ourselves, um, and that means winding down neutrality. It no longer no longer serves us, and we need to become more involved in 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 defence initiatives, and that that should go through. The European Union and the European Union is seen as being this kind of safe bet where NATO isn't, and we of course all know that that's that's not that's not the case. Um, I think we're very lucky from Ireland that we have got some very strong voices in the European Union. So everybody here, I'm sure, will know of Claire Daly and and Mick Wallace, who are in the European Parliament. They've been very strong advocates for for peace. Um, and I think in general, Irish people have have held on to this idea that neutrality is, is very important to us, um, even though we constantly have this this uh, idea from the media that that we're we're disruptive in our ideas of neutrality and that we should just um, get on board with this idea that moving forward means joining these defensive alliances or, or becoming part of them. Um, I'm I'm wondering if just because I know Eamon and Liz are great voices on this and and because I don't think Roger is here, if Eamon and Liz want to come in on anything else on neutrality before we move along. Um Eamon, I see your you've got your hand up, so feel free to come in if you want. Yeah, um yeah, thank thanks, Neve. Uh yeah, I would reiterate pretty much everything you've said. Uh um I, I think one of the perhaps difficulties with Irish neutrality is uh, our what you might describe as special relationship with the United States. Um, that's a function to some extent of Irish emigration. I mean, we, we are we are told that there are 30 million people in the United States who might define themselves as Irish. So this special relationship uh, is also an economic relationship whereby American direct investment in Ireland, you know, is, is held up as the greatest uh, saviour, if you like, of, of our of Irish economy. This makes it problematic for us, uh, it seems, to complain about the use of our Shannon Airport um, as more or less a forward base uh, for, for, for the US uh, in, in transit to countries you know, in the mid in the Middle East and elsewhere, so that is a real problematic in terms of our relationship and uh, in our neutrality. It it also allows people to say, ask the question: Is Ireland really neutral? Because this clearly is a breach of our neutrality. So, of the many organisations in Ireland who are pro neutrality and, and and supporting peace, Shannon has become one of the key touchstones. Um. Uh, also, uh, our our prime minister, our Taoiseach, going to Washington, bringing Shamrock on St. Patrick's Day become, becomes an issue around neutrality. But I mean, I would also point out that in the Irish Constitution, this is part of the contradiction. It does say in the Irish Contra Constitution of 1937 that Ireland affirms its devotion to the ideal of peace and friendly cooperation. And it also says that uh, uh, Ireland accepts the general principles of international law as a basis for the resolution of dispute. So while neutrality is not formally mentioned in our constitution, our constitution indicates that we prioritize the peaceful resolution of conflict. So I think those things are important. And also, like Austria, uh, people continue when they're asked in a poll uh, if they support neutrality, a huge majority, you know, up to 70 percent of Irish people say they formally support neutrality. So I think these are all all key issues. But we have that tension and contradiction, perhaps between what people say they want and what our government seems to be moving towards. 
Okay, that's great, Eamon. Thanks for that. Um, Liz, I don't know if you wanted to come in yeah. on anything there. Very briefly, I've nothing uh, great to add to what you said, um, Lee, about what Eamon said. Just one thing is that the media are very much in favour of joining us joining a military alliance and they seem to imply that we need to come as grow up and uh, stop depending on other people to defend us. So um, that's all I want to say. And that all the polls have said in, that Irish people want to be neutral, but our government, unfortunately, seems to be going the other way. That's it. That's, that's great. All. Thank, thanks, Liz. And I see James Kelly with a hand up. I don't know. I don't know you, James, but did you want to come in on the Irish question? I think you're muted at the moment. Yeah. 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 Just to uh, Jimmy Kelly here, probably better known as Jimmy rather than James. Oh. Uh, just thanks, to Jimmy. say Lee, that I'm joining you here from Waterford in Ireland. So just wanted to agree really with uh, what's been said. Uh, in the context of uh, Ireland by yourself, Eamon and Liz, and uh, just to say that uh, really enjoying uh, the course uh, and, and, and the uh, emphasis on neutrality. Um, we do, um, just to make a quick point, we do suffer from a government that is continuously seeking to portray, as I think you made the point yourself, Neve seeking to portray our neutrality as sort of outdated in today's world and that we need to, you know, modernise, which is code language for joining in with alliances that will uh, really uh, just uh, neutralise uh, our neutrality, dilute our neutrality, and uh, they're trying to move in that direction. So uh, thanks for the opportunity to just uh, add those few words. Thank you. Great. Thank thanks very much for that, Jimmy. Um... And sorry to anyone. Well, we've kind of monopolized now the discussion from the Irish contingent, but <laughs> hopefully, hopefully no, it was no, useful yeah. for. <laughs> hopefully that was okay and we did well covering for Roger and we haven't said anything that he'd disagree with, we hope. Um Maybe just to mention one more thing on, on Shannon Airport. I'm from County Clare, which is where Shannon Airport is located for those who, who don't know Ireland's geography so well. But um we're in the where I'm from, we're in the flight path of the of the planes that come in from the US. They fly right over our house. Um and you you will always recognize them. They're very loud. They fly very low because they're coming in to land and the lights, they'll always come in usually at night. Um, and there's something very unsettling about having that happen. I remember it very much in 2003 when the Iraq war was was going on and we had planes coming in over the house. Uh, yeah, very, very, very frequently. We've had millions of U.S. troops come through come through Shannon Airport on their way to wars in the Middle East. We've got no idea what's on the planes. Um, even recently when when with the Ukraine war, there was an attempt to to. Well, not an attempt. There was a statement that said we will that the U.S. was was going to send cluster bombs, um, which are outlawed to Ukraine. That we have no idea whether they came through Shannon Airport, for example. So this is this is the really challenging position that our airport, Shannon Airport, is being used by the U.S. military, and we have absolutely no idea what is what is going through it, whether it includes uh, munitions that are actually that are actually outlawed. Um, and and obviously that raises huge concerns at the moment with with Israel, um, and the the genocidal war on Gaza. Now I I've probably said enough. We've probably all said enough um, in this first part of the session. Um, so I think the idea now is that I will hand over to Kat, who is going to do a, a kind of a wrap up of this last session and an introduction to the next part, and then everybody will be put into breakout groups. Um, with Anna Marie leading that, um, and we'll we'll all have more interaction at that point. So, Kat, I'll 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 hand over to you. Thank you very much, Neve. I just have an information from the control room, uh, which is Michelle. <laughs> uh, so we can take another fifteen minutes for Q and A's for the first uh, three inputs, if it is okay with you. I saw that quite a few of you have posted questions already in the chat or written comments. So now is the time to take the floor and address uh, our speakers. 
Uh, later on, uh, with Anne-Marie, we're going to try to do something different. We're going to split in groups and try to have a more participative discussion, um, something that is not really easy digitally. So now is the, is the moment to come together and ask questions to so the three inputs we got before. Australia, Austria, Ireland, I remind everyone. I see a hand up. Anne-Marie. Uh, yes, just a, a comment. I think I will have, before we split up into breakout groups, I will give a short input to everybody as a, the, as a thank you. Please. Um, sorry, uh, thank you. Yes, I would very much like to read the inquiry that Bevan spoke about, and I'd be very grateful if we could get the web, uh, the name of the report or the reference where we might read it. I think it's a very interesting report. Thank you. So, Gerhard, this is a question for you. I don't know if you uh, heard it, Gerhard. Yeah, um, to student link Thailand. Uh, it was the Australian man. Ah, okay. So, not Gerhard. No. James. The Bevan, I think. Bevan. No, yeah. it was it was Bevan. I mentioned it in the at the beginning, okay. so. I think Bevan is, is going to put the link in the chat. Oh, thank oh. you. Great, okay. thank you. And then Anne-Marie? No. Both hand. So it seems that everybody was very satisfied with the three inputs, and there are not many questions. May I suggest that we run a little bit with the program? So I would now explain how we thought about this workshop we want to do digitally. And then uh, introduce Anne-Marie. She's going to give us a short input. And after that, we're going to come back together and have more time to discuss. So I guess we could do it this way, right? Anne-Marie, I see your hand. If it's something technical, I will first explain what we plan on doing, and then I'm going to hand you off. Uh, no, I have a question to Gerhard. OK. <laughs> because so we have this uh, uh, interesting slide with the wall. Yeah. and all these uh, uh, keywords, buzzwords. And I'm just, uh, I was a little bit wondering why a wall, because the wall nowadays is exclusion, discrimination. <laughs> it's keeping people outside of your own, uh, own uh, whatever, uh, treasure and so on. Why the wall? Please uh, help us to understand. <laughs> it was just an idea yesterday. Uh... I was in the park and I, I saw this beautiful old wall and I thought every brick is a a, a construction <laughs> brick for peace. Yeah. And behind the wall is the war or is the <laughs> is the danger. Yeah. And when I made it, uh, then I thought the same what you <laughs> are thinking also, <laughs> but the war, especially concerning refugees and so on. And what we are doing is maybe negative. Uh, but I, I just love these old bricks, and so I made it. Yeah. So, but maybe it's not so wise to to spread it out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Gerhard, and thank you, Anne Marie. Um, I see uh, another question. Wait a second, Emily. I have to read what you're writing. Would you like to take the floor? Uh, thanks, Kat. Now, I was just saying there were, there were old questions in the chat. I don't know if we have still a little bit of time to address them now or... We do. We do. Yeah. We yeah. Do. Uh, so we have a question there. I'm just reading out loud what Emily uh, sent me. By definition, it's in international affairs. There can be no neutrals unless there are two uh, belligerents. What if a nation does not recognize one of the opponents? Uh, for example, it is a non-state actor uh, group or movement such the FARC in Colombia, or maybe uh, a more close to Europe example, the Kurdish movements, and so on. Would any one Gerhard Benzam or Neve like to take the floor on that question? I guess Neve uh, has more Colombia experience also. Uh, 
Yeah, I can I can mention maybe just on Colombia. Um, I think one of the m most important aspects of the peace negotiations in in Colombia and what really got them underway was the role of Venezuela um, and and also the role of Cuba. But first off, the role of Venezuela um, and Hugo Chavez very much kind of being an actor who had and the Venezuelan government being a, a, a yeah a government and a state obviously that's within the international multilateral system but also um having respect from the uh, and mutual kind of respect and contact also with the FARC as a non-state actor um and so Venezuela played a really important role in being able to bring together um, the Colombian government and the FARC, um, and also then Cuba, Havana obviously hosted the peace uh, negotiations for four years, um, and the fact that that Cuba was able to, um, yeah, even just logistical stuff like facilitating air transport so that uh, people within the FARC were able to leave Colombia and travel to Cuba without fearing that they would be detained and 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 put in prison if they were to travel to a country where that may not be possible. So I think um yeah in the role of in the role of Colombia where you had state and non-state, the role of having at least a neutral country where you could set up and facilitate discussions was really important. So the role of Venezuela and kind of kicking things off initially and then Cuba for holding as having a physical a literal space where people could actually go to talk um and then a bit later on you had norway coming into the picture as well and and other states kind of jumping on board with that but um yeah maybe that's just one of the examples on on how things played out in in colombia quite clear thank you Neve. um now there's a second question that i kind of missed i'm sorry for that um I'm reading it out loud again. There is no peace initiative from the European Parliament, uh, neither from Austria, not from Ireland. Why? This is, I guess, a general question to all of you. Um, if I may tap to this until Gerhard and the rest find an answer, uh, of course, it has political reasons as well, no? Um, so it's a much as a quite complicated question to answer. Um, Gerhard, do you have an idea why Austria is not joining peace initiatives or initiating one in the European Parliament? Uh, you, Kat, Kat, you know the situation in Austria, how uh, everybody avoids to, to speak clearly uh, when it is not within the mainstream. Yeah? And and they are really afraid. I, I'm the the responsible people. They are afraid to to get, I say now, punished by the European uh, politician or by the uh, European Commission if they really uh, take uh, take an initiative. We also saw it when we had this uh, uh, peace conference. Uh, what we had to hear also not yeah. only from the press also yeah. from official politicians and it goes on up to now yeah mm -hmm. and uh, just last week um, there's a new series of of um, peace talk in in the actions radios i don't know if you saw this and also there they try again to to just to destroy it yeah so the and the press is immediately jumping so it is mm -hmm. Uh, there is no free speech concerning the Ukraine. A little bit better with the uh, Palestinian uh, problem, uh, Israel Palestinian problem, but for the Ukraine, there's mm. really no free speech in, in, in our neutral mm. country. This mm. is, is the situation. Yeah. Maybe just uh, in. in, uh, in... <laughs> In this terms of free, having free speech or uh, yeah, the right to, for free speech, we have a really very hard Switzerland as a neutral country, a really a very hard or uh, aggressive campaign in between universities um, relating to the position in the Palestinian is uh, Israeli conflict. 
And the professor from Zurich, for example, she was uh, pro uh, forbidding the, the, the assistants to talk about uh, Palestine uh, as an uh, offended country as well by Israel, and that uh, the two Palestinian researchers involved in the project about gender identities in Arabic, uh, Arabic space, they had to dismiss the, the they had to re, uh, um, re, how do you say re, withdraw from from the from the research due to uh, to the uh, kind of uh, yeah it's uh, for for uh, it's the how do you say the Malkorp who closed the mouth uh, Malkorp, of assistance. Um, uh, how do you say? Huh? Like muzzled. Yeah. But so that's muzzled. not another example of a of a neutral state in not really respecting human rights. Thank you, Anne Marie. I, uh, there's something I have to get rid of. Also, Austria being a neutral state, although being a neutral state, voted twice now against this fire in the Middle East. So this is in the UN. So this is also something that we need to keep in mind. I mean, you, there are a lot of contradictions coming yeah, together. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Uh, so in an effort to solve these contradictions from below, uh, we thought of having a workshop with you today and uh, start a little bit um, exchanging more with each other. Therefore, this is what's going to happen now. First of all, I would like to welcome Anne-Marie Sankar. Anne-Marie, I wrote your bio. Please correct me if I say something wrong. Um, <laughs> we see already that Anne-Marie is organized with WILP um, in Switzerland and Europe, but she also holds a PhD in social anthropology and she has written extensively on migration issues, peace building and development corporations. And for a very long time, she was leading the working group on women's rights and gender realities of the Civic Solidarity Platform, um, um, uh, consulting the body of the OSCE in English. <laughs> it's always difficult to pronounce. Um, and Anne-Marie was so kind to prepare an initial input. This is going to be about 10 minutes. After Anne-Marie's input, um, uh, Michelle will split us into three or four even uh, breakout rooms. In each work breakout room, there will be one of us organizers trying to moderate um, the discussion. But uh, we expect you to come up with your ideas and concerns and comments on a couple of questions that Anne-Marie will present at the end of her input. Um, we, there are a lot of questions. There are about seven questions. We, you don't need to discuss all seven questions in your breakout room. Uh, you can cherry pick the ones that you find more interesting. And then um, as facilitators will ask a person from each breakout room to um, to report back to the big room, so to say. Uh, so 10 minutes input uh, of Anne-Marie, 15 minutes, um, around 15 minutes, we're gonna be in the breakout rooms and then we're gonna come together and try after listening to the reports of the four breakout rooms to weave, um, let's say a common summary. Is that okay and clear for everyone? And um, in case somebody's worried about breakout rooms and what that is, uh, don't worry, we're going to split you in the breakout room. So literally, you just have to accept entering a breakout room and nothing more that you have to do. OK, so Anne-Marie, thank you very much again. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Just one uh, one uh, um, wrong <laughs> position you gave me. Thank you. But it's not true. I was never uh, the, um, the lead leader of uh, the working group on gender realities but always all, all only the participating member okay and the other thing i want to say i'm from switzerland but i'm not really specialist in neutrality in swiss neutrality but what i uh, i have to say or share with you that i was very much involved in very conflictive disputes about peace among the left uh, civil society organizations and it was really very challenging for me uh, because it was always about 
military arms uh, uh, arms and weapons to Ukraine, to Germany, for Ukraine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we really had a huge conflict there. And that's my background a little bit also in being very careful using uh, the, the concept of neutrality. So I would start with this input. I will just read it because my English is sometimes, when I'm tired, it's not very good. So uh, civil society organizations and social movements have in general urgent concerns that they transport to the public sphere. Their requests are thematic, but there are no institutional settings being seen as addressees. They are particularly present and important when states fail, for example, in providing social infrastructure for the well being of all citizens, uh, climate change, but also in finding ways to peace in times of war or armed violent conflicts. I'm, I'm kind of taking up some words of the head of campaigning uh, of Amnesty International in Switzerland. He was explaining this a little bit more in detail. We can observe that states prefer the militarized ways to peace at the moment. Reasons are manifold from economic and geostrategic to national identity building. Civil society movements for peace are nowadays criticizing the policies as wrong tracks historically rooted in a patriarchal understanding of power Instead, civil society is focusing rather on peace and human rights movements and mainly on disarmament appeals. It's maybe even contradictory to what uh, neutrality and peace in combination are, uh, are transported by the states, even by Switzerland. Collective voices are arguing against investments in war material, for rearmament, underlining the side effect of patriarchal reinforcement, like masculinities, toxic masculinities, and post-colonial power relations. Again, the, the rather the rich North defining um, beginnings and ends of wars. Civil society is creating spaces to discuss the impact of a polarizing national security uh, policies affected behind the facade of neutrality. So facade of neutrality, that's what uh, is kind of kept in my brain. Civil organizations encourage people to analyze the impact of rearmament and militarization legitimized by the narrative of a threatened national security, a little bit what Ireland was, uh, was uh, uh, shown as, a bundle of images of enemy, including the evil always coming from outside. Sometimes some more the refugees, but nowadays it's clear who is uh, the enemy and the evil. Neutrality implies at least the renunciation of a military alliance, that's the, uh, the minimal condition. But we should, uh, we should, as what else so-called neutral states combine with this concept, what, where, why, and when is neutrality nowadays used and to legitimize what kind of political action? What does it mean from civil society perspective? And what does it mean from the from the uh, uh, political powers. From my point of view, it is crucial for a civil society understanding of neutrality to dismantle stereotyping politics, preventing the polarization in friend and enemy. If we look at the current debates, neutrality is a strategic decision to dissent in times of military block building, east, west, north, south. To enact or enforce peace, neutrality is not enough. But a neutral state has more space to maneuver in times of war and more resources to dedicate in the diplomatic efforts if he wants to. Maybe he has hidden interests behind which prevents him 
from really reinforcing diplomatic efforts. But if they decide to do so, which is really not guaranteed at all, we always have to also watch what kind of economic interests are still hidden behind. They may pre-violin that this is decision-making process in a sense that the industry and trade of arms subvert to the so-called neutrality as a non-military attitude. And I think in Switzerland now, this uh, neutrality concept is highly contested. On one side, neutrality is becoming the so-called constructive neutrality. Everybody is trying to reinventing the, the meaning of the concept. In this context, neutrality means an instrument of power used by states such as Switzerland as a means for national identity building. Pacifist movements, however, act transnationally, building alliances with like-minded organizations independently where they are rooted to emphasize their concerns and to transform them into political action. From this point of view, civil movements might identify neutrality as a post-capitalist neoliberal narrative as used nowadays by the, power, uh, the countries in power, the states in power, and which masks actually geostrategic power relations, economic interests. And we really have to be careful as, 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 so, as civil society in not, uh, not forget to dismantle, to deconstruct the, the, um, the use of the concept, who, what for, and when is it used. I understand neutrality as a construct, which is relevant in larger setting of interconnected states. The concept of neutrality, its connotation and configuration emerge in the course of the formation of nation states. We should not forget that. It reflects the dominant voice of mainly white men who created and framed this concept of the modern nation state or not. If neutrality is integrated, then it's also part of it. This evolution is comparable to the likewise historically formed national constitutions. In the national context, feminist approaches would first focus on ethics of care and people's well-being, while the dominant patriarchal strategies tend to reinforce militarized security without questioning the neutrality of the state. This comes, uh, this has become much more important in times of the very dominant discourse of insecurity. What, why are we uh, threatened in our security? In the peace conference in Munich a month ago, the Irish, <laughs> the Irish member of the Euro European Parliament, Claire Daly, painted a shocking picture of the militarization of the European Union in favor of the multifaceted arms industry, reinforcing the Cold War as a hot one in ever closer cooperation with NATO. Massive financial transfers with, uh, with documented figures from social and environmental policy to the security sector in this case, investment in the army are in full flow. That's why feminists are underlining so much the importance of gender responsive budgeting, even uh, or especially during times of war. The very idea of peace as a core pillar of the European Union has been militarized when the same companies profit from armament and, and border protection and defense against migration fooling conflicts both internally and externally. How can a country like Switzerland imposing civil society a militarized national security program still defend proudly its meaning of neutrality? Marginalizing in that way social security in everyday life, housing, education, health, the civil response to this development is not about neutrality, but about interconnecting aspects of peace, care, climate change, or workers' rights. It's about dismantling the ambiguity of the myth of neutrality, a playground for opportunistic policies.
Feminist movements fight against patriarchal revivals, striving for gender justice. Not, uh, neutrality may make sense when it's a real way to peace, including disarmament and demilitarization. But it is not acceptable if it's just masking the hidden power interests of patriarchal hegemony, such as economic interests of the multinational companies. Social movements that defeat human and women's rights against rearmament and militarization of all spheres of life are hardly compatible with the concept of neutrality as it is used today by the rich countries of the global north who are claiming their neutrality. Sure, neutral zones, as for example in Colombia, we heard about that, they may exist. <clears throat> Also, for example, in churches, in peace zones, in, uh, in uh, places like Neve Shalom in Israel, still we also have to admit that they exist because of discriminatory policies, of military interventions, of violence against civil society. Constantly threatened by militarized interventions, they are creating as a very powerful uh, instrument these kind of spaces. But it's probably also a question of time to be dissolved again, assimilated, instrumentalized. From a feminist perspective, again, civil society needs a strong voice against war, against armament, against any increase in budgets in favor of the army. And this is important for us. That's much more important than to defend neutrality. In term, the term neutrality anyway is very vague and must therefore be analyzed in detail. Who uses the concept without interest and for what purposes? That's where my de uh, deconstructivistic <laughs> approach comes in. Narratives such as neutrality have their meaning in a power-driven space. Their meaning arises from conflicts of interest and geostrategic ambitions for power. The question of who has the power of definition to apply or change the concept of neutrality and with what uh, objectives, this especially in times of war, we have to observe very carefully. Who feels stressed or even guilty for not sharing the neutrality policy? like, for example, what happened to us in the Vienna uh, Peace Conference last summer. And who decides about the ways of pacifying? How do we pacify? For inst instance, by referring to neutrality, but then what does it really mean in practice? Short, the blurred concept of neutrality demands critical reflection of civil society practices. So that's kind of a, a provocative final sentence. And now there are quite a few questions. And uh, with Kate, we decided it's probably better that you just choose one or two and you take it, the, uh, the discussion back uh, to the plenary afterwards. Kate, now you have the floor again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the thought. Oops. Did I do that? I will. Oh, Michelle did it. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so thank you again, Anne Marie. And now we're going to show you, and I'm going to read out loud again, two slides combining these seven questions. Okay. Uh, I guess we will also share the document uh, in the chat at some point so that you can advise and reflect on the questions because of course it's impossible you remember all of them in your working group but i'll now go ahead and read them out loud so first what are your experiences in a civil space um, discussion of safety militarization or social security what about your country what do normal people think everyday people think about it how do they practice it second what do you see as pillars and the principles of neutrality based on your experiences? And how can a civic society actively contribute to the discussion around neutrality and how states practice it? Three, is there a field of tension between neutrality recalled by militarized states, even without a NATO membership, 
and the minority narrative in neutral spaces reclaimed by civic society, such as peace movements engaging for disarmament and demilitarization. Four, how can civic society reinforce a concept and practice of neutrality, which serves the well-being of the people, neutrality understood as safe spaces for peace building? Next slide. Thank you, Michelle. Five, in North countries that are uh, um, such as Switzerland do not follow suit on NATO armament obligations, uh, do these no North countries, which are not NATO members, um, militarize, weaponize? I think we have a glitch there in the writing. Actually, they're not obliged to do so in theory, but in practice, do they follow this strategic reflection? Uh, and does this dominate the discourse on militarization and peace? Six, do you have examples of powerful initiatives for peace, shaping the neutrality concept from a human rights and nature rights perspective, or even other aspects of work that civic society is involved in, for example, combating climate change and inequalities? And seven, how is neutrality viewed within your respective countries? Do people have an understanding of what it means and how it could be practiced? Now, my advice for the working group is not to stress to answer all of them. If you read them again, you will realize they're kind of clustered. So you have the first three questions really dealing with the contradictions that accompany the neutrality concept. Mm -hmm. Then there are two questions at least that are addressing the will and power of society from below. And of course, there is the other cluster of questions really putting in question how neutrality is narrated in politics and what are the contradictions there. Example, the NATO uh, question you just read. So uh, I would ask now Michelle to split us in the working group, breakout rooms, sorry. Then uh, we should take 15 minutes to discuss with each other. And please remember to volunteer to report back in the big group for maximum three minutes uh, when we rejoice in 15 minutes from now.
Hi, everyone. This, hi. This has been faster than a speed dating session. I don't know how uh, your discussions went down, but I had the feeling it was really not enough time. And on behalf of us organizing this, I'm really sorry. We had only 15 minutes. It felt like lightning. Yes, that's quite true. Um, so I guess, uh, I don't know how it is, but at least from my working group, I will be the one reported because we practically everybody could take the floor once. And there were two people that didn't have the chance to take the floor. Um, I think different, different parts of the discussion stuck with different people. I mean, first of all, the contradiction, uh, tra contradictory nature of neutrality, you know, declaring neutrality as a state, acting in another way is something that, of course, um, uh, was evident. Then there was um, a comment saying how important it would be to pick up neutrality as a social movement demand and try to shape it from below. Oh, um, then there was um, uh, uh, another uh, guest saying that um, kind of funding for peace uh, for certain states, in this particular example, it was the U.S., could be and should be considered as an active, uh, let's say, um, active way to support uh, peace. And then um, there was a quite um, quite a good and condensed comment by John um, saying that uh, in times of conflict, um, resisting conflict is a form of neutrality. And he's quite sure, and I think that he spoke for all of us, that the power of neutrality is quite evident when it comes to interstate relationship. That is why, um, um, you are able to negotiate when establishing neutrality more or less. I, this is very bad. I feel very ashamed that I couldn't summarize it better. But yeah, I'm curious what happened in the other groups and if the time passed uh, so fast for all of you too. So do I have anybody else that uh, would like to sum up some of the discussions? Will I From go, any? Kat? Yeah, please. For my group, yeah. Um, okay, so we kind of ended up speaking a bit about the different realities in the different countries that we're from. So we had some feedback from Egypt, Norway, Italy, and Ireland, I suppose. Um, and I suppose the main thing there is how different the diff the the realities are in each of these countries, and I suppose the Oh, there's hammering going on next door. I hope you can't hear that. <laughs> I hope it stops. Anyways, um, uh, so um, the different realities in the different countries. So we had, for example, in Egypt, where you have absolutely no space at all. Um, you really just cannot even raise questions around neutrality, disarmament, military, military budget. There's no space at all for critical thinking. It would become a dangerous thing for you to do actually for your physical and psychological integrity if you were to start raising such questions like that um that they're just impossible to tackle um and then we heard uh, from um yeah i suppose the the question of in norway the threat from the russian say you know the the idea that the russians are coming to get everyone in norway and there's a national panic about that um then the kind of the with Palestine, how everything has become so controversial. So we had a bit of a discussion on all of these things and where neutrality could kind of feed in or not, if there was any space for that. And we finished with a comment on, um, yeah, it's kind of the citizens organizing and standing up for this idea of peace and neutrality is what ultimately brings hope. And even if that's not possible in all of the countries that we're coming from, at least in some of them it is, and that opens up space for, for others also to, to kind of take that forward. So I'll, I'll leave it at that, Kat. Thanks, Neve. I just added something I forgot in my sum up. Um, somebody else from the other two working groups, breakout rooms, yeah, I can do next. I can go next if you want. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, our um, yeah, actually in our working group, there was just me, Anna Marie, and another participants that were able to to share a little bit of of input. So we were a, a small <laughs> one, but it was still very interesting. And uh, the question we started with was number seven um, about how uh, on the line same line as Neve, how, how neutrality is perceived in your own country. And I started saying that uh, I'm also originally from Italy, and it's something that I don't think it's very present in the Italian discourse or in the Italian, yeah, so public, um, yeah, discourse. And I, I was saying that every time I think, or before uh, getting more familiar with the terminology and the concepts and uh, all the inputs we had during this webinar, for me as an Italian, every time I heard about neutrality, my mind was just uh, answering with Switzerland and that was it. So uh, I asked Anna-Marie how, how it is really in, in Switzerland as a citizen and not as an expert, how it's perceived, because for me it was really interesting to hear how identity most of the time for, for these countries, for example, also with Costa Rica, uh, we we also heard that for, for, for Costa Rican is also something that it's really present within one's identity as a citizen. And Anna Marie was saying that actually um, in the last times, years, maybe now the, the this terminology as uh, on the same line as, as Neve was mentioning, it's getting neutrality as a term is getting like empty, like a it's yeah getting even more empty and also outdated. That was the the adjective we used, and maybe it would be uh, important to reframe it, like really make clear to people what neutrality really means, because nowadays it's mostly used from politicians as a yeah as a empty terminology or just for yeah. Uh, yeah, politics and not really for like a, another um, bright, yeah, more um, comprehensive understanding as we are stating here and as as civil as civil society uh, we would like to have like neutrality as a as a tool for peace, and then we heard from uh, the perspective from uh, Chifundo from Malawi. And he was sharing that in in probably in the African continent and in Malawi, uh, also being neutral is not really a question because historically uh, you were always on one side. And nowadays, for example, there is this um, uh, division between China, you are with China or you are with the United States uh, in the case of Malawi. And he was also saying that it's not easy to talk about neutrality and to be and to be neutral. And then uh, we were moving to the question number four. Uh, maybe, yeah, I don't think we have much time left, but uh, we wonder how uh, we could, as civil society, create more spaces for neutrality, but in the sense of uh, peace building more than as a political tool. And I think I can close here for now. We Thank are missing you. one group. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I would like to ask Rosary, uh, Diane, or Trey uh, for the group number four. Um, hi guys, I'll try my best. Um, so the the discussion of the group began when um Kareem shared about the experience of France, and she said that um, please correct me to my group mates, please correct me or add if you want to have something to add if I'm wrong or if you want to add something. So Kareem talked about um how neutrality is not really um talked about in French society and that there's a need for awareness building. Uh, about neutrality. Uh, and then I also shared about the experience of the Philippines. And I also agreed that in my country, it's not really a concept that's really broadly known. Um, because as, as the, I think it was session two or three or four, one of the speakers talked about um, our current geopolitical situation uh, that we are between China and the US. And then um, James Kelly, Jim, uh, one of our group mates from Ireland, talked about um, the experience of Ireland. And uh, he said that uh, the survey, there was a survey that uh, was conducted about, I think people were asked if you know uh, they wanted to be neutral or not. And 
from what I heard from him, uh, he said that 70% of the people responded that they did want to be neutral, but I think the government has other plans. And he also gave the example of Shannon Airport that's been used by the U.S. Uh, as a jump off point for some of the armed conflicts that is that is has taken part uh, of. And then one of our group mates from Kenya, uh, John, John, uh, John talked about how he thinks his country is not really like supposed to be his country by concept is not aligned with like you know like any idea from what I know any party or uh, ideology, but and actually he also feels that his country is. Um, partial to the US, to Britain. So uh, to sum it all up, I did really um, have a pleasure. Uh, and uh, it was really a very, very quick lightning session. But I think we were really able to talk about um, like, uh, what's this, uh, our, our, experience, uh, our experience from our different countries. And uh, I, I might forget, uh, Liz also asked, uh, like, uh, were there movements from the civil society or any uh, like stakeholder in my country uh, to like what's this uh, to promote neutrality? And I just said from experience that I know that there's a peace journalism uh, movement in the Philippines. So in peace journalism, they try to find common ground between the parties uh, in terms of reportage. So thank you, and I hope uh, I didn't miss anything. So. My roommates can, uh, my groupmates can add uh, if they want to. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Rosary. Thank you to everyone for being so patient. Also, we learn as we go. I'm sorry again that we have such little time for discussing. But as Michelle wrote already uh, in next session next week, we we're going to have more time. And I hope you all join us. I'm super, super thankful uh, that we are a truly global group. Um, so as, as long as there are people from all over the globe thinking about neutrality and peace and ways out of this craziness, I think there's hope. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Warm thank you to Michelle and Emily for organizing everything and to our speakers, of course, and to Neve for jumping in for Roger and see you next week.